With us now are Dr. Aubrey de Grey and Bill Falloon. Pleasure to have you back on the show. Sir, good to have you back. It's Great been more be than a year, I think, since we last had a conversation. What's really interesting is strategies for engineered negligible senescence. That is one fascinating name for an organization. Tell our audience what it's all about. Yeah, we don't tend to, um, it's a bit of a mouthful, we don't tend to use the whole thing very much these days. But the origin of the term, when I came up with it back in 2000, was based on a term that was 10 years older that was um, uh, coined by one of my colleagues in the biology of aging, a guy named Tuck Finch. Um, he coined the term negligible senescence. And he was just being a very careful scientist. What he really meant was non-senescence. In other words, an organism not getting older at all. But he specifically was applying it to populations in the wild. Now, of course, a population in the wild, you don't know when the individual that you're looking at was born. Uh, so you can't tell their exact age. So you have to kind of guess. And um, well, there's a lot of statistics that can be done. But the long and short of it is that you come up with an approximate number. Uh, you can say, you can say a maximum rate at which the organism, the species, is aging. And you could say that the minimum rate is zero, but you can't say that the actual rate is zero. So that's what he called negligible senescence. So of course, engineered negligible senescence is simply turning a population or a species that exhibits perfectly good senescence into one that doesn't. And the strategies thing just made it a nice acronym. There is such an acceleration of technology and progress Bill, what's happening since we last were conversing together, the three of us? Well, a continuation of human age reversal initiatives. Projects that are using existing technologies, such as a drug called rapamycin. And in every model, every model of an animal that they've studied it with, those animals live longer. Mice live about 60% longer when they tr take this drug, rapamycin. Now, rapamycin is used by organ transplant patients. They take about a milligram every single day. It creates some side effects for them. But a new protocol has been developed where you take between two and five milligrams of rapamycin just once a week, just once a week. And in doing that, we're seeing some good anecdotal feedback from the people who are doing it. And there's a clinical trial going on right now in Southern California where people are being given rapamycin and we're measuring the aging biomarkers and also clinical measures such as glucose, lipids, blood pressure to see if rapamycin cannot reverse certain aspects of aging in people today. Really absolutely amazing. And what is new with the SENS Foundation? SENS Research Foundation is doing quite a lot at the moment that's pretty new. But the main thing I would say that we're doing is a kind of generic thing. We are spinning companies out. So. Um, five years ago, even three years ago, we had a whole bunch of projects going on in parallel, um, very diverse projects addressing the various components of sense, the seven strands, the seven deadly things as I call them. But, you know, we were a 501c3 and that was all we were. And we were attracting philanthropic money and we were doing as much as we could, but it was painful. And then, one by one, our projects began to reach a point where they were investable, where they were, had made just enough proof of concept that the people at the real visionary end of the investor spectrum were willing to take a punt and actually fund, at seed level, a company. And we've done that five times now over the past few years. So that's a real development for us. Another development that's very recent is that we have been able to attract a big surge of philanthropic money, especially from the cryptocurrency world, as a result of the enormous surge in cryptocurrency value that's happened. But in terms of the research we're doing, the basic themes are just the same as they always were, except for the ones that we've spun out, of course, where so we're able to focus on the, the most difficult areas, the ones that are still not ready for that kind of level of prime time. And, um, and we're very happy with how things are going. Bill, what do you see in the, in the near future? Well, here in South Florida, there's going to be two young plasma exchange research projects run by different principal investigators. Uh, one will use stem cell mobilized young plasma, monthly infusions into elderly people, careful measurements to see if we cannot reverse the aging process of elderly people so that they can function as a more youthful individual. The other procedure will involve an apheresis where their old plasma proteins will be removed while a simultaneous administration of youthful plasma will be administered. 
two different protocols, but similar, that they rely on young, healthy plasma, which contains all kinds of factors that enable young people to be so healthy. And we feel by restoring that young plasma into older people in a way that will restore youthful functionality, these elderly people may grow biologically younger. We don't know that yet though. We need to do these two clinical trials. And the great news is they're both ready to start. What happens after these trials? Well, if the trials are successful, we publish, we disseminate the information, we encourage others to jump on board to make this widely available. And of course, what we wanna do is identify specifically what is in that young plasma that enables those older people to grow younger. Now in the beginning, we don't really need to know if young plasma makes older people grow younger, we've already found a way to at least delay aging and, and hopefully delay death. But we need to find specifically what's in that plasma so we can make it available to everyone. And I'd like to emphasize that, you know, obviously sometimes clinical trials fail, um, and, but that's still useful. So even if this clinical trial is not as successful as Bill and I hope it's gonna be, Nevertheless, we'll still have learned a great deal about how to do it better next time, and eventually we will get there, in fact, probably quite soon. So this trial, whatever happens to it, is a huge step forward in anti-aging medicine. Oh, absolutely. We are looking forward to seeing exactly what's happening. We may see certain aging bar biomarkers go in the right direction and others not be affected at all. So we do plan, by the way, for this to be a 50-year uh, clinical study, meaning that if we get initial results, well then we'll add in that rapamycin drug and see how well that does in addition to young plasma. We'll add in a number of other interventions. The objective is to keep everyone alive during this clinical trial, and most of these people are going to be over 55 when they start. What implication does all of this have on society as a whole and the economy and the healthcare situation in our world today? It'll spare Medicare from insolvency if we can find a cure for aging. Medicare is being bankrupted because old people cost a lot of money. And they cost a lot of money because they get sick. But if we can reverse aging or even delay it a little bit, we're gonna spare Medicare from almost inevitable financial catastrophe. And this does actually, I mean, I, I think Bill's answer very much um, highlights the, um, the challenge that we have in shifting public policy and this applies, of course, worldwide, not only in the US. Because some of my colleagues who are specialists in the biology of aging have been having you know, very intensive dialogue with people on Capitol Hill for decades now. And they've been talking far more modestly than Bill and I do in terms of the amount of progress that we have a good chance of making in the foreseeable future. They've been talking about maybe postponing um, the ill health of old age by five years, seven years. Even with those kinds of relatively modest numbers, the numbers that you get out in terms of dollars saved are just out of this world. And still, there's been no real change in public policy. I think, ultimately, this tells us that the inherent attitude on Capitol Hill, even though they can't justify it scientifically, is that the people who are doing this research are overstating the likelihood that the research will bear fruits and that actually aging is just this inevitable thing and fixing it is like fixing perfect, perpetual motion and and like you know so however valuable it might be if you succeeded the probability of success is zero and you know any number times zero is still zero so they're not going to do it so in other words we do have to combine our advocacy efforts with actual results actual progress in the laboratory and certainly at my end of things i'm certainly seeing the tone of the conversations I'm having changing with every incremental step forward that is taken, whether by Sense Research Foundation or by others, that just makes it look at that little bit more plausible that we might actually be telling the truth. Are you both criticized less today than you were in the past is an unpleasant question, but I'd, I'd like to ask it. Far less. Well, we're finding that once we explain what's going on with animal research, where old animals are growing biologically younger or their aging process is significantly delayed, and we are translating those findings into human clinical trials, and the preliminary data indicates we're seeing some results, we're gonna know the full spectrum of these benefits very shortly. I think towards the end of 2018, there's gonna be several landmark published studies in which they're going to be able to demonstrate significant age reversal in response to NAD infusions, 
perhaps rapamycin and metformin put together. Uh, Dacitinab, which is a senolytic drug that can purge the body of senescent cells. Uh, young plasma transfer, and that's being studied in a number of different arenas right now. We don't know which way works the best, so we're trying them all. We have 5,000 Americans every day dying from a degenerative illness, so there's no time to waste. So what we're seeking to do is accelerate this research in every way imaginable. Aubrey, I'd like to ask you why you actually started the organization. Back in the early 2000s, when I had made what I believed was the decisive breakthrough in terms of understanding how to defeat aging, and when I had also made pretty much all the necessary progress in getting top scientists on board with enthusiasm for actually helping me implement this, I still had this third problem to solve, which was supporting it with financial um, you know, clout, because uh, ultimately biology is expensive. So the question was how to go about that. And you know, the, I, one could go to the government and write grant applications. It was perfectly clear to me that that was a complete non-starter because the whole process of peer review was endemically biased against any high-risk, high-reward work, as well as cross-disciplinary work, which this certainly was. The second alternative was the private sector, you know, to go and look for investors who would be willing to um, start companies in this area. Again, you know, there's only so long term that a company, an investor is going to look. And we just didn't have um, you know, a value proposition that joined the dots sufficiently for investors. So the only alternative was a charity, was to create something which would be funded by philanthropy, and that's what we did. And it worked out. I mean, it was slow, of course, but in 2006, when Peter Thiel came in his, as our first major donor, things started to pick up. And um, you know, obviously it's been quite successful. It seems to have been the right way to go. And as things have gone on, and we have got a lot, project after project, to a point where they are investable and we can spin them out, it's continued to be the case that the nonprofit, the 501c3 Sense Research Foundation, is the essential, indispensable engine room of all of this. You know, we are the people who create the projects that will be the next startup. And that means that the case that we make to investors, even if they're not really very philanthropically inclined, is that they should give us money as well because that's how they will get access to the information that will let them be the first investor in the next startup. Really very interesting. And it just makes me think again about the past and how Dr. Robert Mendelssohn, I think he was, was the president of the AMA, wrote this book, Confessions of a Medical Heretic. It really shocked the establishment, and you shocked the establishment by writing a book called Pharmocracy. And now, uh, Pharmocracy too is shaking people up. Tell us about it. Well, the Life Extension Foundation has been battling the conventional medical establishment since our inception. We advocated that people use low-dose aspirin to reduce the risk of ischemic stroke and heart attack. We battled the FDA for 15 years before they accepted the fact that low-dose aspirin might be effective. And nowadays, typical people will take aspirin to reduce thrombotic stroke, thrombotic heart attack type risk. We introduced a number of therapies that are now accepted by the medical mainstream. But back in the early 1980s, we had to battle the FDA tooth and nail. But the bottom line is we won in court and we won in Congress. 1994, Congress passed a law that prohibited the FDA from arbitrarily seizing dietary supplements and restricting the types of health claims that could be made. So people can now know that coenzyme Q10, which is sold by hundreds of companies, if taken in a proper dose, it can slow the progression of heart failure. It can even improve ejection fraction in people who have pretty far advanced heart failure. And here's a dietary supplement over the counter that we had to battle the FDA for over 20 years to get any kind of acceptance whatsoever. And I'd like to say, Bill, you've also shown that you can win in the court of public opinion. You know, I mean, I guess aspirin is the single best example. You know, so many people take low dose aspirin. First now. Amendment aspirin. Yeah, I mean, really, you know, I think you can genuinely say, you can genuinely claim with some force that this would not have happened without your efforts. Well, that's correct. The way re reason we won in Congress is our supporters were inundating their representatives with mail demanding that they get the FDA off the backs of dietary supplement makers. So you now have free, wide, widely available supplements at affordable prices. You go to almost any other country in the world, dietary supplements are made by drug companies. They're low potency and they're very expensive. The United States has the most liberal laws in the world as it relates to access that consumers have to supplements. And yes, we did get 
the public opinion on our side because we presented the scientific findings showing how certain nutrients could provide enormous beneficial results and why was the FDA suppressing this truthful, non-misleading information. Aubrey, you've been speaking to audiences on TED Talks and even in Israel. Tell us a little bit about your experiences in public appearances. Yeah, I've given several hundred talks over the past 15 years, and you know I, I'm, I'm probably around 50 talks a year, something like that, um, all over the world. Still, the majority, the overwhelming majority, are in Northern America and Western Europe, and that's disappointing. It, what it says is that I'm getting very little exposure, very little take up, really, of this message in the Far East, well, in Asia in general. And I always feel that that's paradoxical because, you know, the Asian cultures are generally known for having you no know, particularly good respect for the elderly as, a, uh, as compared to the West. Um, I've come to the conclusion that it's the wrong kind of respect. It's the kind of respect that, yes, keeps the elderly integrated in society and generally gets the most out of their declining health, but um, at the same time it, make, it makes it even harder than it is in the West for people to get the hang of the idea that aging is a medical problem and that we might be able to do something about it and that we actually should do something about it. I think we will see it changing, but the Asian cultures are way lagging right now. Israel's an interesting case, actually. In Israel, I've been there um, three or four times, I guess. I've always had a pretty good reception. Certainly, we have some very vigorous advocates over there. And some of the people in, um, in Russia, or, well, of course, there's a great deal of crosstalk culturally between the two countries. I would say those are the two countries out of the whole world in which there is, a, in which there is the least problem in terms of what I call the pro-aging trance, the irrational rejection of the idea that we should do something about aging. But also, um, in general, I, I, I'm handicapped in another way when I go to Israel or Russia, in that they tend to be countries, and actually this also applies in Asia, where philanthropy is not so strongly developed. It's just not so much part of the DNA. Um, and so since most of my work historically has been at the philanthropic level, it's been difficult. Again, that's something that um, may very well be changing quite rapidly over the next couple of years as we spin out more and more and as the genuine um, uh, re uh, rejuvenation biotechnology industry with the emphasis on the word industry actually you know, becomes a real thing. Well, uh I, I don't want to contradict what your observations are because unlike you, Aubrey, I don't travel a lot. But what I've been told is uh, South Korea and some other Asian countries, they're spending a lot of money to find solutions for aging. And some of the people that we're associated with are actually spending a lot of time over there interacting with their scientists. So culturally, they may not have accepted it, but certainly s certain components, compartments of their scientific communities are aggressively pursuing CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. They're, they're, they're looking into ways to live a lot longer. I've had people at this building actually come up and offer me first class airline tickets to Hong Kong to meet with billionaires who don't want to die. They want to find a cure for aging. And I tell them, well, I'll do a conference call, but I'm not going to waste my time flying to Hong Kong because I'm doing too much work here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, traveling is always a double-edged sword that way, isn't it? I always find that I have to make hard choices that way as to whether to, whether to get on a plane or not. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what you say is true. I think one of the things that may be different in the East is that Chinese wall, I suppose that's a pun, isn't it now, um, uh, between, um, between the so-called age-related diseases on the one hand and aging itself on the other hand. This is a, a wall that shouldn't exist, it has no biological validity, and yet it makes a huge difference and causes the um, misspending of vast quantities of money in the West on medical research and medical practice, on approaches to the ill health of old age that are never going to be productive. It may be that as the Far East and well, as Asia in general catches up on this, that they somehow at least don't make that mistake quite so severely as we made it. And if so, then we've got a good chance. I can hardly imagine anything more interesting than the work you are doing. And I'd like us to continue, but we do have to wrap this up. And I'd like to ask you to give us a statement as to how you see the near future, both of you. Go ahead, Bill. Well, based on data that I believe will be published in 2018, we're going to see that there is an ability for older people to achieve at least some, regain some of their youthful functionality. And this is via studies that have been funded with rather low cost budgets. 
uh, with doctors and laboratories and companies just donating their time to see if it isn't possible to take an elderly person with comorbidities, their obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, all kinds of problems and give them one anti-aging intervention and see most of those go away. I think you're going to see that published in 2018 and it may make headline news. It may waken up the public to the fact that aging does go the other direction if you properly intervene. So that's where I see it going over the next one year possibly. Absolutely fascinating and incredible. Sir? I think that we're going to have a very exciting couple of years. It's going to be years in which you know, all of the hard work that people like Bill and myself have put in over decades starts to, you know, we really begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel. In terms of the research that's being done, that's pretty clear already. You know, things that were at the absolute apex, the hardest areas that we knew needed to be tackled, we are beginning to actually make some progress. The point of this trial, of course, is that it provides a template, a precedent. So anyone who comes along wanting to do something that's going to be more effective in reversing aging, like for example what Bill was just talking about, if they want to get a clinical trial approved by the FDA with a good chance of getting an eventual treatment approved by the FDA for actual application in the clinic, they've got the, the, the legwork to, for the conversation with the FDA has now been done. I must say this is the most exciting time ever. In the 20 years I've known you and have interviewed you, Bill, this really has to be the most exciting time. I'd like to thank you very much for being with us again. We'll thank have to you. do this again next year. Thank you. Bill, always a pleasure. It is. Human age reversal. We may be there already. Human studies are now ready to begin to confirm meaningful reversal of pathological aging processes. These clinical trials aim to alter older humans so that they function as much younger individuals. Even modest success will result in a paradigm shift that will impart enormous societal benefits, such as sparing Medicare from insolvency. Life extension is not standing idle while 5,000 Americans die each day from age-related illnesses. Joining us are physician scientists who want to hurry up these technologies to keep people from aging to death. While Life Extension is pushing these projects forward, we need financial help to ensure these studies are carried through to fruition.